title of my talk is Preschooling Our College Writing Students. I want us to ruminate in the title just a little bit to really think about what schooling means, especially as we heard it described today. Um, thinking about Antero's talk is about the harm that schooling can do um, to distinct various backgrounds. I don't want to suggest that we return to some back to basics or um, some more elementary approach to teaching college, but more that we can draw from these uh, connections between these pedagogies to really try to feel uh, some of the harm that might have been done in our students' uh, schooling experiences. I want to invite you all, take a minute, free write, draw a picture, think about any way that you want to process um, this prompt. What are some of your earliest memories of learning? The earliest memories of learning. With the school. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The earliest memories of learning, whether that was in school or not. And then reflect for a minute, what does this teach you about yourself? As college instructors, we probably have plenty of time to kind of think about our learning and teaching style or think about our teaching style in terms of our own learning styles. So for our first year freshmen, they might not have a on this. Thirty seconds, and then you can continue reflecting while I okay. So, to try to keep myself within this thirty-minute time slot here. I want to start with a little bit of my own background, since that's what I just asked you to do. And I asked my students to do the same thing. Um, a lot of my this. Towards a theory of preschooling comes from Paul Freer. He'll talk a lot about his work and how I frame uh, my theory within that. Um, how I discuss the problems or issues with schooling with students, a solution, possible uh, approach to think about preschooling pedagogy. I really appreciate how our grading contract uh, folks went earlier because they've been influenced by us out anyway as well, and uh, the entire ecology of our classrooms. Um, in terms of assessment and other things. So the three main components of my course that I really want to think about in this curriculum that I've developed really over my whole teaching career, um, really learning career, you know, learning experiences, uh, is thinking about uh, reading the world narrative and how we can allow our students to be more metacognitive of their own learning style. Uh, using some approaches from multi-literacies theory and also from universal design for learning to think about how we might apply this in college. And then the action um, for my students, I frame my students' major projects as teaching projects. They teach the class, they come back and um, <clears throat> try to be co-teachers of the class. And for this year, uh, it was the first year as well that I have um, started a community service learning class with my first year writing course. So students are also engaged as teachers in the community with preschoolers and other um, other age levels as well. And then I have some student reflections. So this is little me and my <laughs> sister, um, on the uh, house in Cal in the house in Calistoga that I grew up in, um, Northern California. I grew up in Calistoga, which is a very prominent uh, farm worker community. About half the students in the school are speakers of Spanish when they come to the school, um, or Half the students in the school um, have a background with multiple languages, as you said. Um, my, my mom was a first year, first grade teacher in that class. I was in her first grade class. Um, you can imagine when I got in trouble in kindergarten and second grade, I did not go to the principal's office. I was sent to my mom's class. Um, I also spent a lot of time after school in a classroom. So um, I have education kind of in my, in my blood. Um, my parents did meet when they were. Uh, when my mom was doing her graduate studies at the Ontario Institute of Education. And, um, and so I've kind of always been around these conversations. And some of my earliest memories um, of learning is trying to overhear those adult conversations. Mm -hmm. um, I did go to UC Santa Cruz, graduated in 2005. I studied sociology there, had some amazing professors, 
Um, John Brown Childs was my mentor, and he was a really specialist in sociology of knowledge. So I got uh, kind of this activated imagination of why do we teach the things we teach? Where does this knowledge come from? Why does everything have to be so Eurocentric? Things like that. Uh, I then went in and applied that in my MA in application in 2012. Um, the um, composition of masters as well. Where I studied code meshing, I studied language diversity, and Paula Freer was one of the major. I did also engage in community service myself at Reach Academy from 2017 until the pandemic. So this is a little picture of all my school students. I got to see every Friday morning um, for about three years. And this was in East Oakland. Um, so uh, very diverse community. They were all Latinx or African American students. And then, like I said, I've been developing my uh, community service learning pedagogy for some time now. So to, to frame this within a, a Friarian praxis, where reflection plus action is the, leads to the transformation that we want with our students. In my classroom, the ecology is all about students critically self-reflecting on their learning styles, their abilities, their strengths, and their challenges. And then using that kind of metacognition of how we all learn in the classroom to teach back to the rest of the class, as well as apply that to when they're teaching younger students and the kids. And then the transformation I hope for is some sort of healing by not returning back to this model, but by drawing on models of learning that we all can remember work on. So this idea of, we're gonna say conscientization, um, idea of critical awareness, this comes from a teacher, um, teacher education uh, article where it is a means of critical analysis by which people discover they're in a situation, a discovery of one's situationality. And like the previous slide said, in order that students see themselves as co-creators of reality, um, both in our classrooms and in the world. So Freire worked with laborers. This is a pre-service teachers article. And I want to apply this to how we can frame learning within our first year writing class. Our students are transitioning from high school, as we just learned, and maybe one of the most traumatic periods of time that they've gone through um, in a schooling experience, just because of all the back and forth and insecurity. Um, and they bring a lot of baggage with them to our classroom at college um, about school, about writing, and about grades. I really appreciate the uh, contract rating talks earlier. They can sometimes feel lost in the woods. This idea of critical awareness of their own learning styles reaffirms that. They are meant to be here. They are okay. They belong here. And the multiple learning styles and challenges are okay, especially with writing. It gives students agency and self advocacy. A lot of my class is about finding learning resources on campus. And the goal is to heal past the problem. So I'll skip the 30 second video, but this is linked in the, the slides there. Defining the problem of schooling is also really important. And I do this with students through their own experiences but also with this visual RSA talk um, by Ken Robinson, who emphasizes that multiple intelligences are not valued in school. The education system tracks people inequitably. Standardized testing is a huge problem and is biased. He argues that ADHD is overdiagnosed and has risen with the rise of standardized testing as basically just a, a different way of learning. It is drawing on a uh, pure banking concept of education where Students are just empty vessels and they uh, basically are waiting to be filled with the knowledge that we think is important to them. And his main thesis, which I also appreciate about uh, Tomeo's talk, is that school kills creativity and diversion thinking. Um, and as one consequence, arts education can suffer. So grading is one of those things that kills student creativity. In my class, one of the later assignments is a problem-solution research paper that is based on some problem that students see in their own high school experience um, in middle and or high school. So how does that relate or not to any of the themes that we pulled out of um, the TED Talk? So of the RSA. So standardized testing, something about arts education, something about divergent learning styles. A lot of students grasp on this idea of mental health resources. Um, financial literacy was brought up. The idea of college, college is worth it for some students was brought up as these are students' choice of topics. So we start this with the metacognitive dialogue 
with um, in our early weeks of the semester, thinking about how do we heal from the baggage of skiing? So Blair's concept, how do you read the world? What are some of your earliest memories? Was this before schooling, as we defined it? What does this teach you about yourself? And we really focus on awareness of personal learning style and to the goal of recreating and reliving in the text you were writing, the experience you lived at a time when you did not yet read words. So what some people might call pre-literate, but just a different kind of literacy. So this is the kind of seminal text in my course, um, the importance of the act of reading, a speech that Paul Freer gave. So reading the world precedes reading the word, and the subsequent reading of the word cannot dispense with continually reading the world. Language and reality reading experience are dynamically intertwined. So we think about reading as a much bigger concept than just reading words on a page. I love this quote. I don't think I have time to read it. Um, you know, I'll read just the bottom. So he's remembering how he came up, uh, how he learned the word squatting. And it wasn't by um, sounding out letters or a phonics approach or memorizing what uh, the definition of the word means in the dictionary. His whole theory is about embodied whole language approaches where we are making meaning of words, but also of concepts through our own experience and through connections. So he, in that previous text, this gives a really beautiful description of how he learned the word squashing by observing the whole life cycle of the mango, seeing it fall on the ground, turn different colors, and then he was able to measure that. So thinking about a whole ecological approach, reading the world with multiple learning styles is linked to this idea of multi-literacy. I have an image of typos there because that's one of my earliest memory, uh, learning memories. Um, thinking about going and finding those crabs or trying to see something new. And it kind of links with a more creative multi literacy approach. So, multiple modalities of meaning making, um, as well as the necessity of diversity and representations of meaning making, whether that be specialist forms of language used by scientists or a mixture of texts visual images, or video on a pop culture fan website. So literacy, in this sense, is meaning making in various ways, and maybe um, ways that our students are much more familiar with than we are. They can teach us something different. So also thinking of forms of diverse video games, social media, and children's match and play. So these are theories from Sarah Keating and G, who uh, are advocating to bring this type of pedagogy into our college composition classroom. Make learning fun again. So the readers of multimodal texts are at agency. They're not only constructing what is depicted or represented, but also design the way the text is read, the reading path, what is attended to, and in the process, they're constructing a unique experience during their transaction with the text. It's like Paula Freer did, and um, I ask my students to do when they're thinking about their early memory. So it is similar to universal design for, for learning. And I do engage students in multi, uh, multiple multimodal projects. I ask them to create visual texts. I ask them to um, create websites sometimes. And um, their teaching presentations have to be multimodal as well. Just uh, I have been influenced by universal design for learning over the pandemic. It was a big focus at San Francisco State for professional development. And so just to kind of recap that we want students to engage in multiple ways with various texts. We want students to feel that um, their language and identity, uh, that they can represent that in multiple ways as well, not only through written words, not only through academic language. And uh, we want to give them means of to actually action um, and expression. So with visual texts, with code meshing, teaching projects, um, using having giving them all of these opportunities to teach the class. Also use um, an anti-racist lens to view this. I bring in when we negotiate our grading contract, I bring in Timo Kuhn's white supremacy culture. And we talk about how even though this is a writing class, rhetoric and thinking about um, how you develop your connection with your audience is not only about writing. We can actually develop rhetorical awareness 
maybe even more effectively than students through visual means or through activities that the students create. Um, for example, when I ask them to teach the class about the text they read, I ask them, I, I suggest to them that the quotes that you find could engage the audience in the classroom could be the same quotes that you use in the final paper that I have to write. So connecting with that audience, choosing those quotes intentionally um, is the point. So the action, the main project that we just did in the spring was to create a course project. So I also directed to Sherman College. I asked my students to, if you could teach a course on anything, this is a group project, bring some of your knowledge to us. Go find a text, um, you choose the topic, you choose the learning activities, you've been practicing multiple active learning activities throughout the year, so choose one of those uh, models and bring it back to the classroom. And this is up to you to um, decide how we're all going to learn best. The preschooling pedagogy as a healing process. And students could quickly reflect. I want to actually get some of the reflections um, on their own experience in the education system. They gain awareness of their situ situationality in college, where now they, in college they have more control over their learning processes. And they can reframe literacies and their own learning styles um, and their own multiple knowledges through the projects that we do in our class and through their research work. I'll leave these for you to read um, later. Um, so much fun. Fun was a good word. I should just highlight some of these words that you know. And, I do uh, encourage you to go look at these later. The idea of multiple literacies was a super helpful way for me to realize that there's much more to learning and reading another way. Mm -hmm. He says here, uh, we think advanced class have a better understanding of who I am as a learner, which is definitely going to help me with other classes in the future without your transfer to this model. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually would love to hear one or two of your early memories of learning, and then I would have to catch yourself. So, yes, so um, there is a word fun there again. Um, it was not always about reading and writing, there was reflecting, life lessons, connection, and fun. Would anyone like to share? We have five the one minute left. No, yeah, like two. Would anyone like to? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm good at sharing. So, uh, one of my early memories was when I was in, in preschool. I heard there was one day when the teacher came in or someone, anyway, and evidently the preschool cat had bitten a banana slug and had to go to a vet because it's job support. So, check. And that was the biggest thing for me. It was a cat. It was a slug. It was this drama. Anyway, it was the, the natural world and a big story. Anyway, it's very exciting. Yeah, I still remember. If you were in my class, I would love to read that essay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember that from uh, my K through 12 uh, grade experience, we did have uh, sort of a, an experimental uh teach a lower classman exercise and uh, i think i mean i was playing school since i was in preschool so i always kind of <laughs> lean this way but um i think that real life experience like from the earth that day like when it became real and when you can see how you can connect or like if you can actually influence someone's thinking, I think that pretty much like sealed the deal for me to go into the whole like pedagogical realm <laughs> uh, as a career down the road. So uh, that would be great. So we do have some teacher classmate like in class stuff going on sometimes. Uh, I mean, I tried it out in some semesters and sometimes like, keep experimenting with other things, <laughs> um, but I kind of like give me revisit that idea again. <laughs> I will just say that some of my students write about positive experiences in middle and high school, and I think that's great. We can say that this is a good start of some changes, yeah. but we can talk about the education system and our interaction. So we have about seven minutes or so for questions that we kind of 
transition nicely. Thank you, Dan, by the way. Um, and then you will clap and then questions or comments. Hopefully mostly questions. You're, you're good. You've got I double checked with Heather. <laughs> I, have, I have a question for advice on something. Um, so for the class that I presented on this morning about the happiness project class, mm -hmm. my actually what I really, really wanted to do, but I just didn't know how to do it over like one week that I have to break to figure out that. Um, I really wanted because I know to feel happy, quote unquote, is to help others. Mm -hmm. And so what I was wanting them to do is I wanted my students to be involved in some kind of um, project-based experiential learning service learning. And I was really looking for my students speak other languages that maybe a, a, a partnership with an elementary school would be good, maybe coming in and teaching like Mandarin language or characters or calligraphy or you know, do something like that. But I really don't even know how to start. So if you could give me some advice on how would you even begin trying to figure this out? Yeah, um, so I actually would suggest the Campus Children's Center or the Campus Preschool and child care. <laughs> Someone. Like, right? I didn't know when I had my right. kids, but then so, I discovered we had one. <laughs> yeah, so I, always, I always saw it for the last seven years walking past or, you know, on the way to class. And so I finally reached out to the director and they were open arms to have my students come to their classes. Um, and so, and they were basically teaching them all kinds of language development skills. Um, and obviously, it wasn't only about reading. When we go to and do uh, story time in preschools, it's all about singing and games and then doing these books as well, because it's all about having fun with language and making them laugh. You know? So, um, I, I guess to answer your question, yeah, but, um, start with the, the campus center because obviously it's convenient for students. They're going to be on campus anyway, hopefully. Right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, another way I think that you can reach out to the Department of Education mm -hmm. uh, and teacher training, you know, because they are usually connected with K-12 schools and uh, they have teachers, you know, who have to practice uh, in subject credentials, uh, programs and that kind of stuff. So they might help out. And then the other organization my students volunteered with was Reading Partner. And that's a very big organization in many cities. Um, the one thing about that is they had to get it fingerprinted. And that was mm. a big hassle. We basically delayed our uh, start. But luckily, it was a year long course. So the uh, students who didn't get it done in the fall could get their service hours done as well. But um, yeah, thinking about things like fingerprinting and logistics when you're starting to do a community service um, option is something that warning to think about ahead. Yeah. Mm. The 114, I mean, 104, 104 yeah. So, this is the first time a, a community service learning class has been. It's a year long course. It's always yeah. been a 114. What do you do it with the 114? Um, Joe Lee, who um, you may know, um, and multiple other uh, teachers have done the 114 already. Right? So, would I do it with the 114? Um, I love the 104, 105 stretch class. It's my been my baby for the last seven years. So, I, I love having the connections with the students over the whole year. And, um, up until now, they were lower class sizes, but thanks to the neoliberal terms of the university, we're uh, making everything more different and not asking questions what we think about it. So you can strike, that's a state might strike them. That's one of the reasons. Dan, this isn't a question, but I just wanted to let you know that Rachel from Ohlone College said thank you and that you had an inspiring course design. Okay. So just to make sure that message got to you. Any other questions, or would anyone else like to share their early memories of learning? I had written, I had written, hi, uh, <laughs> Toby here. Um, I had written this um, in my yard when I was doing the Zoom class last, no, uh, spring 2020. Yeah. So I asked my students to write about a memory. So it's this kind of a prose poem, and it has my PS 188 short. We played in the yard, running and screaming. We'd forgotten the teachers we teased with mean names behind their backs, of course. We feared the classmates we had stolen from, those who took our lunch money and ruined our favorite crayons and ruined our pasty art projects. But we loved our principal's booming Robert Frost voice over the loudspeaker, the road not taken, for stopping by the woods on a snowy evening, and the day's stench of classroom wet chalk and unwashed clothes, and boiled milk, 
indoors so many days without sun or the days of spring into summer. We couldn't wait until the end of June for sweet release. The way one might feel as a bowl getting filled up by random strange information, such as how many herds of elks in Lapland, the moons of Jupiter, the number of ounces in a soup can, how many slices of a pie might slide off the spade triangular spatula, equal enough for the whole family. But father's got more. No one questioned that history, not discussed. But let's build the diorama of soldiers in the fort, the destroyers and their destruction and conquest. But what did the people eat before they were starved or decimated? But let's build a house to replicate their lives as something we learn. So it's a meta, it's a, it's meta because there's a voice of a child perhaps in the memory of the adult. And I guess it's play around with it. I love that, thank you. Why would we ever want to put that kid in front of a computer screen and make them fill out bubbles? Um, I, yeah, so I have done a lot of poetry in my classes, but I love to allow students to be creative um, and think about using different voices for different audiences. Thank you, and maybe to just kind of piggyback awesome. on oh you're the last one. Oh, okay. <laughs> just to piggyback on that, um, I we just had a workshop at San Jose State uh for a uh, development, uh choose your own adventure, where you get to you know have a list of different activities. Uh if, if you know if it doesn't have to be like a uniform essay <laughs> that you worked on, you know, on four weeks, you know, to experiment the genre. But um, to allow some creativity and to allow, um, you know, like different ways of <laughs> expression. So I, I found that to be a nice option that for some reason, like I haven't really practiced before, but it was a good reminder that, you know, you can uh, give, you know, it can be a video or a visual essay or a poem or, you know, and you can just come up with all kinds of alternatives and they can choose from the list. and. Ashna's snapshot memoir earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All of the other examples that you all 